Welcome to Violin Adventures number 205. This week we continue work on our 1800s violin. We also start work on a second 1800s violin. And we have some, some extra special little tidbits. Hope you enjoy. So we have a little bit of everything going on right now. I'm working on our 1800s violin. I've almost got the neck completely fit, but before that, I'm going to put in a support here so that this broken out button will be very nice and strong. We've also got our other repair here that we've got to start on, which means I'm going to open up the top. We've got the professor's cello back here looking gorgeous. It is drying. Okay, we've got our clamps and our hot glue and we're going to put this support in here okay here we go we've got a good support piece here and then next we'll fit the neck Okay, we're ready. We've got a new pot of glue. It's so good to have fresh glue when you're doing an important part like the neck. And we've got our clamp ready and some leather. So we're ready to glue up the neck. We're going to let that dry for 24 hours and we're moving on now to this violin. This is a French manufactured violin. We're going to open it up and replace the bass bar and check out these cracks, make sure everything is done properly. But before we do that, let's have us, we're going to play it and see how it sounds. so it feels a little bit dead so we'll see if we can fix that okay it's time 
to open it up. Okay, let's have a look inside. So right away we can see that this is an older violin from the 1800s. These repairs are very nicely done, although the grain is going in the wrong direction, so we'll fix that. Also, this is a very old base bar with not much shape to it, so definitely we need to take that out. That'll really improve the tone. And then here's the inside of the back. There's the lower block, very small. But otherwise, we have corner blocks, so this looks good. So this violin is definitely from the 1800s. It's a very nice old violin, but as you look at this violin, it's got a new coat of varnish. And by new, I don't mean just brand new, but somebody in the past re-varnished re this violin. So the sad thing is, and I'm bringing this up because the last two violins have been in this condition where they've been re-varnished. And when you re-varnish an old violin, you take away the value of the instrument and it also, you've taken off the original varnish, which helps in dating. And the varnish on a violin is part of the maker's art. And so it's like taking a painting and changing the painting. So if you have an instrument and it looks really bad, it's better not to re-varnish it. Unless you have an instrument that doesn't have a name, it has no value and you really want it re-varnished. The next thing to know is don't re-varnish it with something down at the hardware store. Like this one and the one before, they look like they've been varnished with a varathene or any kind of varnish that is at the hardware store is going to not work for your instrument vibrating. Violins are so... To get the best tone, you want a violin that can vibrate with nothing holding it back. And so when you use a varnish from the hardware store, it is just coating it. It's muting it. It is keeping it from vibrating. Every fiber wants to vibrate. I guess what I'm trying to say is an oil varnish from the store is different from an oil varnish made for violins. So be very careful about re-varnishing your instrument. It needs to be varnish that is made for violins if you're going to do it. All right, back to work on this beautiful old violin from the 1800s. You can tell that by the wood. I think what I'm do, gonna do next is just get this base bar out. If you look up closely, you can see a lot of glue here. And there is an opening here between the base bar and the top, so that will not help the sound either. So let's get this old base bar out. The angle is incorrect, the shape is no good. So as you can see, these cute little cleats just popped right off. So they were not helping the violin. They're just gonna be like little mutes. Okay, so the top ones up here didn't come off so easily, but they were boxwood rather than spruce or pine. So, 
we can definitely improve the tone here by getting these off. And the inside of this top is very, very rough. So I'm gonna smooth it down. Okay, our base bar is fit. We've got it ready to glue into the top. And I've warmed up our hot glue and it's nice and fresh. And now we just need some clamps. The base bar is in. Work on the new violin. Time for a story. All right, we're reading out of Violins and Violinists by Franz Farga, and we're starting on chapter six, entitled Jacob Stainer, an Austrian genius. 20 years before the birth of Antonio Stradivari, and while Nicola Amati was still groping his way to perfection, the Austrians produced a genius who has won for his country a place of honor in the history of violin making. Jacob Stainer, a true master of his art, who equaled Nicola Amati and was surpassed only by Stradivari, created the Austro-German violin in such perfection that it held its place against all rivals for more than a century and a half. Jacob Stainer's life, however, was a grim road of suffering and unhappiness compared with the serene calm of Stradivari's working days. Both men were born poor, but one died as Cremona's wealthiest citizen, while the other was hounded and finally destroyed by two pitiless powers, greed and intolerance. Jacob Stainer was a Tyrolean born in Absin near Hall on the 14th of July, 1621. His parents were Martin Stainer and Sabina Grafinger. In those days, Absin was a well-to-do community, most of whose members earned their living at the salt works of Hall a few miles away. We know next to nothing about Stainer's youth, but as many wood carvers lived at Absom and Hall, we can assume that he learned that craft from them. This is borne out by the beautifully carved lion's heads on his violins. There were several lute makers in neighboring Innsbruck, some of whom had learned violin making in Italy, and he thus had opportunity of finding an efficient teacher in his native country. It has been said that he was trained for some time by Nicola Motti, but there is little evidence of this. 
The question is, when could he have found the time to work in Cremona? His education was good for the times in which he lived. He was not only a skilled wood carver, but also an excellent mechanic, and he played the violin with a brilliant technique. At the age of 18, he was already selling his violins in the market at Hall. There is little trace of Italian influence in them, and we have no evidence that he understood or spoke Italian. A violin is not produced overnight. The artist needs a workshop, and he must grope, probe, and create for years until his product satisfies him and he finds buyers. Stainer, therefore, would have had to start work in Amati's workshop as a very small boy and leave after a rather short time. This sounds improbable. As the Cremonese masters had to comply with very strict guild regulations requiring that they should keep and teach an apprentice for a minimum of six years, as has already been mentioned. Even the argument that Stainer began by copying Amati's design is no evidence that he was in Italy, for in Innsbruck, there where he most likely served his apprenticeship, there was a splendid princely court. Archduke Leopold resided in that town, and all the arts were cultivated at his court. There was, in particular, at Innsbruck Court Orchestra, composed wholly of Italian musicians. Stainer had, therefore, sufficient chance to play and examine Amati violins. At any rate, he set up his own workshop at the age of 17 and began to work at full speed. Before going into the details of his violins, the various episodes of his tragic private life may be worth recounting. When still underage, he fell in love with Margaret, a very poor girl, three years younger than himself. On October 7, 1643, Jacob's illegitimate child was christened. He married the following month, and at first the young couple lived with her parents. In those days, many merchants came to Hall, from where almost every day salt transports left for Bavaria and Bohemia, countries which had no salt mines of their own. The road traveled by these transports was called significantly Golden Lane, and it was used by strolling peddlers to bring all manner of merchandise to Bohemia. In those days, about 14,000 horses moved through every week. On their way back, the salt caravans took the products of Bohemia to South Germany and the Tyrol. Beer, malt, hops, honey, leather, grain, linen, and glassware. The foreign traders who visited Hall were good customers for Stainer's violins, and he sold his instruments cheaply at four florins apiece. Shortly after his wedding, Stainer traveled traveled to Salzburg, where he received 30 florins for a viola from the most serene treasury, according to a still existing receipt. In the following year, he is said to have traveled to Venice, perhaps in order to buy the right kind of maple wood for the backs of his violins and ingredients for his varnish. Meanwhile, in the land of Tyrol, a new sovereign reigned, Archduke Charles Ferdinand. He may 1648, on the occasion of the opening of a new gallery in the salt mines, and was accompanied by his wife and his brother. It was then that Stainer was introduced to the Archduke, who admired his magnificent plane, examined his instruments, and subsequently invited him several times to Innsbruck. This encouraged Stainer to address a petition to the Archduke, asking him for an order to make violins for the Innsbruck Court Orchestra. The proceeds, he said, would allow him to settle a debt of 400 florins, which his father-in-law owed to the Fugger Salt Works in Hall. The Archduke agreed, and Stainer was full of hope of early prosperity. He purchased a small house with a garden. His art was now at its height, and experts bestowed on him a great title, on October 1658, the Archduke appointed him court violin maker together with the title Honored and Noble Sir. The road to fame and wealth seemed to lie open before him, but due to an unfortunate incident which had happened in 1647, now this was about 10 years earlier, things turned out very differently. Among the foreign traders who used to come to Hall was a certain Hubner from 
Kirchdorf, when he saw Stainer's violins, he scented a profit-making business and suggested to the young master who was still struggling hard that he should come to his house and make a number of instruments there. Stainer agreed, gave up his workshop, and moved to Hubner's house where he worked diligently from 1647 until early in 1648. But when the day for the settlement of accounts arrived, Hubner claimed that Stainer owed him 24 florins for board, rent, and other expenses. Even after he had disposed of the violins made by Stainer, Stainer Penniless disclaimed this debt, left Kirchdorf in great indignation, and returned to his hometown. He thought that the unfortunate affair had come to an end not foreseeing that he had started something which would crash down on him like a thunderbolt later on. So he moved back, and now, this is December 1662, the Archduke died and his brother succeeded him. The new Archduke was no lover of the arts and dismissed all the musicians of the Innsbruck Court Orchestra. He died a few years later, and as a result, Tyrol went in went to Emperor Leopold I. At that time, Stainer had nine children, eight girls and one son, who, however, died early. His last child, Gertrude, was born in 1666. The following year, Stainer was cited before the court of law in Tours. Hubner, the merchant, had given notice after 19 years that he claimed his money, nearly 40 florins, including interest, although he admitted in his plaint that he had employed Stainer as a violin maker. Stainer explained the position and pointed out that he had made two dozen excellent violins for the claimant. The judge suggested settlement out of court, and in order to bring the unpleasant dispute to an end, Stainer made an advance of 15 florins, promising to pay the rest at the next fair in Hall. In the autumn of 1668, Stainer addressed the councillors of Innsbruck, a petition to the emperor asking him to confirm the title which had been bestowed on him by the archduke and to appoint him court musician. Both requests were granted by a diploma dated January 1669. Since the quality and experience in violin making of this faithful and dear Stainer has been greatly praised to his majesty. And we're going to stop there. We're right in the middle of it. And it looks like he has some more troubles in the days ahead. So we'll probably finish the chapter next time. Freddie wants to chat. Hi, hi. I'm Freddie. Yeah, that's me. I'm Freddie. And I wanted to tell you about the string group that came. And every month they play music at our house, so we have a lot of fun. And so, here they are. <laughs>
the Hebrew Minute. Now, since this week is a special week, it is the week of Rosh Hashanah or Yom Teruah, which is the blowing of the trumpets. For our Hebrew Minute, we'll listen to the shofar being blown. We spend all day blowing the shofar. Let's see if we can hear the shofar blast. <laughs> Well, this is a beautiful early fall afternoon. Let's go inside. Here we are. We've got our Appalachian Mountain, and yes, it is growing. Here's the progress we've made. We've got to go around the edges and just get more shape. And here's our special 1800s violin. And here's the other 1800s with a new neck on. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you for your wonderful comments. Thank you for your thumbs up. And thank you to the new subscribers. And until next time, bye.